What's up, guys? It is Monday, September 12th. It's 1.29 p.m., and this is going to be a catch-up on the news from last week, from over the weekend, and then I'm going to do a follow-up newsletter today, which will be news of the day today, so we're on track. So let's dive into it. We've got a good amount of stuff up here, as you can see, so let's just get into it. So this is Jim Rickards talking about a global settlement currency. XRP works well here, so let's hear it. In terms of uh, the BRICS countries are doing today, if you guys didn't see the video I did yesterday, I will link it up here in the top right-hand corner. Uh, but here's Jim Rickards, okay? Adding on to that point, if you guys didn't see yesterday's video, I suggest you bookmark this, go check out yesterday's video, and then come back to this and listen to what Jim Rickards says. Okay, basically complementing what I was talking about yesterday. Here's Jim Rickards. Listen to this. Rex just said, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China expanded their meetings and their uh, work to include a lot more countries. So Argentina, Iran, Turkey, a lot of other economies who have these BRICS conferences. They've announced that they're working on some kind of uh, global settlement currency. And, and I would make the distinction between a payment currency and a reserve currency. People tend to confuse the two. They tend to talk about the reserve currency status. That's the tough nut to crack. It, it, it can happen. Sterling used to be the main reserve currency. It lost its role between 1914 and 1944, but that took 30 years. Um, now the dollar may be losing its role, but that's gonna be a slow process. But the payment currency is different. You could use almost anything as a payment currency, assuming the parties agree. So they may come up with an international payment currency backed by a basket of commodities and they're all commodity producers you know russia has oil and natural gas saudi arabia has oil brazil again has oil but also large agriculture producer in the world africa has you know enormous mineral outputs etc so you go around the, the membership and uh, you, you can see that they've, they've got the commodity potential commodity backing for that the shanghai cooperation organization sco is a central asian group led by Russia and China. But again, they're attracting new members. They're working on something similar and uh, and, and others are as well. And of course, we've got our, our friends over in, uh, in crypto world. I don't think that will be uh, a reserve currency probably ever, but as a medium of exchange, as a payment, it could perform a role. And I've, I've lectured about and hypothesized that Russia and China could develop a new digital currency, it could be a cryptocurrency, call it the Xi coin, Putin coin, whatever you like, and use that as a payment mechanism. But all you're really doing with any payment currency is you're keeping score. So a lot so there we go. So just outlining exactly what is about to go down. And it's gonna happen pretty soon here. And then we have the Pope imposes deadline for Vatican to transfer assets to the bank. Pope Francis has imposed an October 1st deadline for all Holy See offices and Vatican-linked institutions to deposit their assets with the Vatican Bank. Francis' decree follows his decision earlier this year to entrust management of all Vatican assets to one office, the patrimony office known as APSA, in a bid to end decades of mismanagement that culminated with the scandal of over 350 million euro investment in a London property. Ten people, including former Vatican officials and external brokers, are on trial in the Vatican tri tribune tribunal on finance-related charges related to the deal. The Vatican's economy ministry in july issued a new investment policy requiring all vatican departments to transfer their assets and investments to apps via its accounts at the vatican bank known as the institute for religious works or ior no specific deadline was given but the decree published tuesday says all assets must be transferred by september 30th the need for a new decree imposing a fixed deadline and stressing there was no exceptions to the regulation regulations suggests some offices or institutions were hoping to keep external accounts or investments the Vatican Bank has long been mired in scandal, but has spent the past decade cleaning up its books and ridding itself of its reputation as an offshore tax haven. Years of reform have slimmed down its client list of Vatican offices. Um, it currently has some 5.1 billion euros in assets under management and reported 18 million euros in profits last year. So might be a coincidence, but we also have. Let me see, where is it at? Oh, here it is. We got our girl Rosie Rios the other day visiting Pope Francis and, you know, talking about elevating global spirituality through respective platforms. The world has never needed this more than now. So maybe a coincidence or maybe she was saying, hey, use XRP for those funds. So there we go. So then we got 
also to the passing of Queen Elizabeth, rest in peace, and the Operation London bridge has been set in an action. So London Bridge is down, the secret plan for the days after the Queen's death. So they're going, um, they're basically tossing the baton from Queen Elizabeth to King Charles now. So there's going to be a lot of implications that happen with this. So there's going to be a new kind of beginning over there in London, UK, and who knows what could come from it. So then we have also 9-11 was yesterday. So rest in peace, everybody, 9-11. Never forget that. But then we have Bank of Canada Cash COVID-19, the prospects for a Canadian digital dollar. We provide an analysis of cash trends in Canada before and during the COVID-19 pandemic. We also consider the potential two scenarios for issuance of a central bank digital currency in Canada, the emergence of a cashless society or the widespread use of an alternative digital currency in Canada. So let's um, dive into this, see what's up with it. So this is about 28 pages, but I feel like I came across some interesting stuff in here. So let's see. I'm going to go through it. So I'm going to look up our favorite keywords. So find, we're going to do wholesale. Let's do CBDC. Or I'm going to look up cross-border. Nothing with cross-border. Let's see interoperability. Interoperability, nope. Let's see retail. Let's go to... ISO 222, no good keywords in this, huh? So I'm actually gonna skip this because it doesn't have any of our keywords, then we just know that Canada's getting ready to do a central bank digital currency. And then this is the uh, website with the queen. And then electronic trade documents, UK government moves ahead with groundbreaking legislation. I was looking into this. So the new legislation, which is hoped to be enacted by early 2023, initially seeks to change the law in relation to a limited category of documents, bills of exchange, promissory notes, bill of lading, ship deliveries. The new law will treat exclusive control over an electronic record containing the same bundle of contractual rights that exist in a bill of lading and other selected documents as equivalent to possession under English law. It is a small but very neat way to permit electronic trade documents without disrupting hundreds of years of legal precedent and associated commercial practice, which depends on it. So they're just kind of, they're tweaking the law just a little bit to not totally disrupt the law, but to add a, a little bit of verbiage that includes digital electronic documents or where was it? Yeah, electronic trade documents into the verbiage so that they abide by the similar laws. So it's just that digitalization that's happening all across the world. They have to get the regulations in to allow the full adoption of this digital economy that's coming uh, on the way to allow it to happen. So that's going on over there, the UK and uh, US, I believe it was. Yep. And then we can keep moving forward. And this was on the Fed now website and you can see the buildings, everything like that, how it kind of like looks. And it was funny because I was looking at the ripples new video and this is new from the Fed Fed now program on their website. And then I was looking at this and I was like, it's kind of similar as far as like the buildings and just for global and just the whole like kind of concept what they're talking about slow settlements so we see the same similar thing here so i thought that was kind of interesting and then we have iso coming through hot it's coming through hot and by 2023 iso 222 will account for 80 percent volumes of high value transactions 87 percent values of high value transactions we're talking high value billions trillions and by 2023 we're so close they're going to have majority of transactions high value transactions being accounted for through iso 222 so when it comes to cross-border payments and having to now move that money through iso in a cross-border fashion you have xrp and a couple other these cryptos right in line to be able to handle that we're talking high value we're talking majority we're talking 2023 we're so close then we have Russia can't do without cross-border crypto payments, consensus reached. Key government institutions have agreed that Russia needs to legalize crypto payments for international settlements. The the proposal has been gaining support in the past few months since Moscow's decision to invade Ukraine was met with a wave after wave of Western sanctions. Financial authorities in Russia consider legalizing international crypto payments in the current conditions 
it is impossible to do without cross-border settlements in cryptocurrency. The Russia Finance Ministry and Central Bank have concluded after reconsidering their positions on the matter. The institutions are obviously referring to the restrictions imposed over the conflict in Ukraine that have significantly limited Russia's access to global finances. The two institutions have had a long-standing clash in regards to the, like, the regula regulation of digital currencies like Bitcoin inside Russia, with the Ministry of Finance pushing for the legalization of various operations with them and Bank of Russia proposing a blanket ban earlier this year. He said the high ranking has updated the Central Bank of Russia has updated its approach regarding crypto payments in the context of foreign trade relations, taking into account the chain situation. We are rethinking it because the infrastructure that we plan to create is too rigid for the use of cryptocurrencies and cross border settlements, which, of course, we must first, first of all, legalize somehow. He said he explained that the goal will be to give Russians the opportunity to use cryptocurrency and international payments on the one hand and on the other place it under control so that there is no possibility of using it for money laundering, payment for drugs or other illicit purposes. He's also suggesting to allow people who open crypto wallets abroad to have wallets offered by domestic entities supervised by the Central Bank of Russia. These will be obliged to comply with the country's anti-money laundering and know your customer regulations. In June, Bank of Russia governor said that cryptocurrency could be used for payments as long as they don't penetrate Russia's financial system. The bank's press service stressed the monetary authority and the finance ministry are not talking about legalizing crypto payment or exchange inside the country. He described digital assets as a safe alternative in foreign trade. So everywhere in the world, this is happening because now we have Real-time growth settlement system in CHAP's annual report 2021 to 2022. This is from the Bank of England. And they are talking about, and we extended the CHAP settlement day on the 30th of June and 30th September 2021 by two hours in response to demands from the property market. Let's see if we can find anything new. So one in April 2022 on a tariff for the renewed RTGS real-time growth settlement service and a second on the future roadmap for RTGS following the delivery of a new of a new core ledger in 2024. So 2024, a new core ledger for real-time growth settlement. We continue to engage with the industry to understand and support the changes to the landscape, including implementation of the model for om omnibus accounts, as well as working with pay.uk on how the settlement model for its new payment architecture will operate in real-time growth settlement. I'm pretty sure pay.uk is partnering with Ripple, but renewed. In January 2022, following feedback from Chaps Direct participants, we announced a revised timetable for the implementation of the RTGS renewal program. The new timeline, not 2024, it's now maintains the move to enhance ISO 2022 messaging in the spring of 2023. So in April 2023, it's going to happen. But instead of a two-stage process with the first stage in June 2022 and the second stage in February 2023, it will now be undertaken in a single stage, so a big bang migration, in April 2023. This will continue to ensure that the renewed service is delivered to the highest levels of resilience and availability, including a comprehensive testing program to ensure that both wider industry and the bank are ready to adopt the new services. Looking ahead, the bank's major focus, in addition to maintaining smooth live operations, is preparing for the transition to the renewed real-time growth settlement system. And in addition to continuing to chair the RTGS CHAPS board, let's keep going. We launched a pilot program in June 2022 that provides a near live-like environment that enables CHAPS direct participants to test enhance ISO 222 messages ahead of the migration of CHAPS payments to ISO 222 in April 2023. This is also helping our own business and technical staff to familiarize themselves with new systems and changes to processes. We will move to a new core ledger for real-time growth settlement in spring 2024, and we have consulted on a revised tariff structure for adoption in 2024. The renewal program has started to broaden engagement out to all RTG RTGS account holders as all, not just CHAPS direct participants, will be directly impacted by the changes to the core ledger. Around the end of 2022, we will publish a response to the consultation on the post-2024 roadmap for RTGS, which sought views on enhancements to support competition and innovations such as alternative networks extending operating hours and synchronization. There we go. So they have... So RTGS and CHAP services are system, systemically important to the UK, and we have a target of at least 
95% operational availability. So close to 365, 24-7 being operational. An operational issue in RTGS and, and or a chat could be, have a wide-ranging impact on the financial system and broader economy. The Bank of England's mission is to promote the good of the people of the United Kingdom by maintaining monitor, monetary and financial stability. And how are they going to do that? Through supporting safe and efficient settlement of obligations and central bank money across a wide range of payment systems. Settlement is final and risk-free as central bank money is the ultimate secure and liquid sterling asset, the lowest risk the lowest risk way for financial institutions to meet their payment obligations. Reserves held in reserve accounts in RTGS under the bank's sterling monetary framework are remunerated at bank rate. RTGS therefore acts as a platform through which monetary policy decisions are implemented. CHAPS provides a safe and efficient system for individual high value and often time critical payments to settle. The banks also reviews the end-to-end -end risk management for CHAPS with the objective of redu reducing risk to financial stability. So there we have kind of like a diagram. Let's see what it says. So you have Vocalink, Image Clearing System, Pay UK, Faster Payments, Link ATM, MasterCard, Visa, Euroclear, Euroclear, Bank of England, C Rest Settlement Bank, CCP members, Ice Clear Europe, LME Clear. Let's see. Let's check the side here. So we can see our strategy for 2022 to 2024. So looking ahead. We have decided to consider our future strategy for the period spanning March 2022 to 2024 rather than annually as had been the case previously. The purpose of this change in approach is to take, up, take us up to when the new core settlement engine for RTGS is introduced in spring 2024 and to support consistency with the wider bank's approach to considering strategy over multiple periods. It will be based on continuing to deliver safe, resilient, and well-run core RTGS, CHAP services, and continuing preparations for the transition to the renewed RTGS system. So when they say they're building a new core settlement engine, it's going to be run on blockchain. And then it's going to have capabilities to be real time, instantaneous, right? And then safe and resilient. So for the retail payments systems, there will be limited windows for onboarding in 2022. These slots are centered in March and October. For 2023, there will be a cluster of slots around August 2023. So October, we have something coming up for this. And then we have this right here. So we support through a broad program of engagement with external stakeholders. We will also continue to engage domestically and internationally with our counterparts operating, operating other RTGS and high value payment systems on topics, including ISO 222 and cross-border payments. The new tariff framework will not be implemented before the delivery of the new real-time growth settlement core real-time growth settlement core settlement engine expected in spring 2024. Let's see. I think that's good. So let's keep going on. So digital euro to focus on personal use, not Web3 EU official says the central bank digital currency could fail if it does, doesn't offer something more than what cash and credit cards also do. A retail digital euro will, in the first stage, only enable payments initiated by people. Rather than, rather than allowing businesses to settle invoices, issue paychecks, or be used in decentralized finance, EU officials said. The bloc has not yet taken on a decision on issuing a C CBDC or even whether it be you either whether even whether it would use Bitcoin style blockchain technology, but a bill to enable the digital alternative to banknotes and coins is due to be published early next year. We have signaled we have signaled out for the first release of the digital euro three use cases. The three immediate applications will be peer-to-peer -peer payments that enable transactions among fa family and friends, consumer consumer to business payments in physical or online stores, and payments to or by governments. Other potential uses of the CBDC, including the payments the payment of wages settlements among businesses, payments initiated automatically by machine and the functionality required to support DeFi could still be considered in the later phase. Whether or not blockchain will be used as a technology is currently not in the investigation phase. Technology should not drive the functionality because ne they need to first consider the requirements of the system to be secure and have sufficient throughput. Officials at the central banks still have to decide where they stand on issues like how transactions with the digital euro will be settled and intermediaries be compensated before finalizing the start of development in 2023 of September. 
So officials at the European Commission, which is responsible for proposing the draft laws that can underpin a digital euro, want the CBDC to be future-proof and able to fit with Web3, but appear to agree there's no rush to do so. A digital euro needs to meet new payment needs. We also need to also be open and adjust and cater for those Web3 users. While DeFi applications are more trends which may be expected to take room in the future, they are not the reality today. Yet the industry has warned the ECB step-by-step approach could jeopardize the whole plan. Some earlier CBDC projects fell through when they didn't improve the status quo in which people can easily pay via cash and card. Digital Euro needs to have clear advantages in use cases. Gross. Oh, let me go back. So some earlier CBDC projects fell through when they didn't have the status quo in which people can easily pay via cash and card, said Jonas Gross, chairman of the Digital Euro Association, a think tank specializing in CBDCs and other forms of digital money. A digital euro needs to have clear advantages and use cases. Gross, whose organization is supported by companies such as Ripple and Circle, said during the same event. It's not sufficient from my perspective to say it's used for peer-to-peer payments or for e-commerce payments. It has to do something better than current, currently existing payment methods. So figures published by International Monitor. Fund last week suggests that about 97 countries are researching, testing, or deploying a CBDC. So close. All right. Now we have... Five banks, including SBI, ICICI, ICICI, that's funny, and talks with Singapore's DBS Bank to begin real-time remittance system. At least five local banks, including State Bank of India and ICICI Bank, are in talks with Singapore's DBS Bank, which is partnered with HBAR as well as Ripple, to begin a real-time remittance system, which is Ripple and Stellar's use case, with the city state using the ubiquitous unified payments interface, UPI, as the backbone said people familiar with the matter. This will become a common remittance platform in collaboration with Singapore's pay now funds transfer service and make the process real time instead of the the more than one day it takes now to complete international transfers. Real time international transfers is what's going on. It's just, it's one of those ideas where it's like, well, why can't I send money anywhere I want and it be there instantly? Like when I send a text message to someone, it's like the the problem, once you realize it is just so evident and the solution is so prominent and like makes sense. And it actually solves a real issue that it's only a matter of time. You know, it takes a lot of time and it already has been a lot of time. They've been working on this for eight years to upgrade the payment systems, replace and uh, enhance and innovate on the financial infrastructure. And they're doing it as we speak. All these dominoes are, are all these kind of balls are set in motion where you have to fix the regulation. Then you have to get all the banks on board. Then you have to uni- have a unified standard. And then there's going to be that one day everybody's ready to go. And then they flip the switch and then it's a whole new different system. And then we have banking platform Temenos partners Bawan Cybertech to expand market presence in India, Sri Lanka, among others. So global banking platform Temenos and digital transformation from Bawan Cybertech said they have signed an exclusive agreement for seven years to scale the former operations in India, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and Bhutan. Remember Ripple's partner with Bhutan? So let's bring that out. So Ripple... CBDC, Bhutan, Royal Monetary Authority of Bhutan, Ripple partner to pilot central bank digital currency. Remember this happened September 22nd, 2021, right there. So Bhutan, and then also we're talking about Temenos, right? So Ripple and Temenos. So Temenos provides like banking, core banking solutions like to central banks, institutions across the world. They're very big. They have like about, I actually want to look them up real quick to show you how big it is. Because what Ripple is doing is they're partnering with these companies that specialize in enterprise software for banks and financial services. They partner with them. They they basically now like Temenos can enable their clients with Ripple software, right? So even though say like Ripple is not partnered with a specific bank, but Temenos is, that bank that's partnered with Temenos but not with Ripple can still utilize Ripple's plugin and software as an XRP because they have Temenos has that Ripple XRP plugin, right? So when you have a company like this, 
It was initially created in 1993. Let's see what I want to get the the deets on them to show you that even though, say, Ripple has a couple hundred partners or people using their platform, since they're partnered with like Temenos and Finastra and these other kind of enterprise solutions for bank platforms, they they have literally global kind of access because these companies have over thousands, ten thousands of partners. And I'm going to show you. So here we have a list of Temenos T24 customers since 2010. Our global team of researchers has been studying Temenos T24 customers around the world. They include the Agricultural Bank of China. They're, that's a company or a bank using T24 Temenos core banking. Uh, a China-based bank and financial service organization. You have Morgan Stanley. You have China's Merchants Bank, Santander, Royal Bank of Canada. You have a ton of big institutions utilizing Temenos software. They're all right here. And that is a whole lot of money moving through Temenos. So you have about 623 entries here of different companies utilizing uh, Temenos software. So that's a trillions, trillions of dollars flowing through. All right, let's, so we got, so we know now what Temenos is and now we have Temenos back in six years ago. This is how long it's been cut deep. It's been planned out. Temenos T24 core banking solution integrates Ripple technology. This was back what? 2016. 2016. Ripple has always been an initiative to bridge the gap between blockchain technology and traditional banking. Now that this protocol has been showcased as an integration into Temenos T24, the future is looking for bright for Ripple and its partners. So there we go. So T24, Temenos has Ripple integration. We just saw that the Agricultural Bank of China and all 600 something institutions are utilizing Temenos C24. And then you have this as well too, banking platform Temenos partners with Cybertrack. They've signed an exclusive agreement for seven years to scale the former's operation in India, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and Bhutan. We know that Ripple is helping the Royal Monetary Authority of Bhutan do their CBDC. See how we make the connections? It's all, it's all right there. And then we have the digital euro, an opportunity for Europe. So why do we need a digital euro? I'm going to look up uh, some keywords. So we'll look up wholesale. Nope. Interoperability. Nope. Let's look up cross border. Okay, so a cross borders and independently of international providers. Nope, nothing there for that. Let's look at, did I do wholesale? Let's see. Nope, not wholesale. I don't know if I did interoperability yet. I think I did. Let's see. Interbank. Nope. So nothing in there for that, but let me see if I can find anything real quick. So when will a decision on the digital euro be made? At the end of 2023, the euro system will decide whether to enter the realization phase, which could take three years. This phase will compromise the development and testing of the technical solutions and frameworks needed for the issuance of a digital euro. All right. And then um, in my newsletter from the other day, we talked about the Bank of International Settlements document, liquidity bridges across central banks for cross-border payments, literally outlining XRP, the XRP use case to a T. That's exactly what it is. It's a liquidity. That's what Ripple's doing. They're building liquidity bridges for central banks for cross-border pay payments, utilizing XRP as that liquidity mechanism. It's right there. So I'm not going to dive into this whole document here, but we kind of know already what they're going to say. And then we have GameStop partners with crypto exchange FTX.us to boost digital asset adoption. And at a high level, the partnership will introduce more GameStop customers to FTX's community and its marketplace for digital assets. And then we have here, introducing the Wisdom Tree Prime digital gold token. Get direct ownership interest in physical gold, but no vault storage fees and physical or digital redemption options. So a new way to own gold. And this is what's going to be happening, right? They're tokenizing gold. They hold it in the vault. 
you have ownership of it. You can prove that it's in the, the vault because it's tied down with the blockchain and you have this digital token representing the gold that's held in that vault. You can take delivery of it physically or you can take a digital kind of delivery of it. So this is the future. Everything is going to be tokenized. Assets that couldn't be tokenized and liquefied are going to be. And that's why there's a lot of money that's going to be flooded into the system. And these cryptocurrency and blockchain protocols that power this tokenization process, they're going to be the most valuable assets in the world. I'm telling you. So there we go. If you want digital gold too, because I, I was looking into getting gold and silver as a hedge, you know, have something tangible. But also too, it's like, all right, you get physical gold, physical silver, and it's just sitting there. It's not doing anything. You don't have the ability to spend it. You don't have the ability to convert it into something else if you want to quickly. Like, so that's why this just all makes sense. sense. Um, and I might open an account here. I actually joined the wait list because if you want to own gold or uh, silver, you might as well do it in a digital way. So you have freedom and flexibility of funds. And then we have Algorand's update could increase speed and cross-chain transaction capability. So Algorand announced a new upgrade launching state proofs, which could increase its cross-chain communication and security. Algorand stated its transactions per second can increase from 1,200 transactions per second to 6,000. That's big. The launch of state proofs is geared toward building out secure cross-chain transactions using the Algorand blockchain. Very good news. Also coming up, Cardano's has like a hard fork happening called the Vassal hard fork end of September. And then in the next couple of days, the Ethereum merge is happening as well, too. So that's a note there. But Fed Vice Chair Bernard calls for crypto specific regulations, note stable coin risks. While crypto has all the same risks that we're very familiar with from traditional finance, its quirks need tailored solutions. So she said the cryptocurrency market bears similar risks to traditional finance, but will need new regulations for situations not covered by existing laws. We have seen that crypto financial system has all the same risks that we're very familiar with from traditional finance. But given the unique characteristics of crypto, there, there's a need for creating clear regulatory guardrails. She's leading the central bank to exploration of a digital U.S. dollar and her role as a number two person at the Fed makes her opinions on crypto quite significant. She had statements before that the sector needs to meet the same safety standard as traditional finance in order to prevent it from becoming a threat to the broader financial system. And she reiterated the risks of stablecoins in her speech. She predicted there will be a lot more of such tokens created by the private sector in the future, calling into question that the central bank should issue its own CBDC. Stablecoins is one of those areas that I think that has the most potential for risk if not properly regulated. And of course, those risks can easily spill into the main core financial system because of the runnable nature of stable coins. So she was, yep, yeah, so there we go. She characterized its report as very strong and she said that she agrees with its recommendations that stable coins should be subject to bank-like regulation and that credential guardrails and the liquidity backstop are the best way to situate stable coins. And then we already know that the Fed's real-time payment system, FedNow, is coming as early as May 2023. Big news. So Vice Chair Leo Bernard, she said, expects the system to launch between May and July next year. Having the capacity to manage money in real time could help households avoid costly late payment fees or free up working capital for small businesses to finance growth. Indeed, during the pandemic, we witnessed how essential rapid access to funds can be as many households started spending emergency relief payments on the day they were received. There we go. And then Ford, so Ford is making big moves into the NFTs and metaverse. So Ford, the American car manufacturer, is jumping on the metaverse bandwagon. According to its recent trademark applications, the auto giant has submitted 19 separate trademarks for all of its key brands. The Dearborn, Michigan-based company intends to offer virtual cars, trucks, vans, and clothing. It has plans for online stores with NFTs. And Hyundai also filed several trademark applications related to the metaverse and NFTs. Its filing extends sports gears, headgear, footwear, eyewear, sports equipment, and other items. Mercedes-Benz, Hyundai, Lamborghini, Bentley, and other and, and Lotus uh, as well too, and other major car manufacturers have also is have also issued their own NFT collections. Luxury hypercar manufacturer W Motors entered into the metaverse space in August. 
And earlier this week, Renault Korea, the South Korean subsidiary of the French auto manufacturer in the Sandbox, a popular metaverse platform, introduced virtual automobile experiences. In the meantime, Alfa Rom- Romeo built NFTs into its vehicles to store maintenance re- records. While automakers are entering the NFT space at a rapid pace, it is not clear whether or not this metaverse fever will produce strong use cases. NFT cars are more expensive than real ones. A recent research article published by shows that some NFT aficionados are willing to pay more for virtual cars than real ones. An image of that Nissan GTR car was sold for a whopping $2.3 million, which is 10 times higher than the cost of the actual car. A video of a detonating Lamborghini was recently sold for $250,000 as an NFT, which also exceeds the value of a real Lambo. Crazy. Okay. So we read this already. And then Russia's Russia's top banks have started lending out yuan and transferring China's currency outside of the SWIFT system. So Russia's top banks have deepened their ties to China's currency and financial system. Moscow-based lender Spurbank said Tuesday it has started lending out money in yuan. And VTB said its first Russian bank to launch money transfers to China via the yuan outside the SWIFT messaging network. Russia's top banks have deepened their ties to China's currency and financial system as Western sanctions keep Moscow shut out from global networks. Spurbank said Tuesday it has started lending out money in yuan as it looks to replace dollar and euro transactions. I don't think Russia will return to such a situation of the dollar's influence on the domestic economy. It's the first Russian bank to launch money transfers to China via the yuan outside the SWIFT messaging system, which is the backbone of the global financial system. And single transaction transfers, Max, okay, okay. The banks will also begin lending in yuan and other so-called friendly non-Western currencies later this year. The new reality is leading to a massive rejection of the use of the dollar and the euro in international payments. The launch of the yuan transfer system will significantly simplify the work of Russian companies and individuals with Chinese partners, increasing the popularity of the yuan in the country. Western sanctions in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine have taken aim at the Kremlin's ability to bank globally by cutting off the country from SWIFT and freezing its foreign exchange reserves held overseas. But since the February invasion, Russia has embraced the yuan as a potential alternative payment method more strongly. Ruble yuan trading volumes have soared and Russia is now the third biggest market for yuan transactions outside the Chinese mainland. There we go. And then the biggest change to our financial system in 50 years is happening in November. And of course, it's the international payments are moving to the blockchain ISO 2022. Many cryptocurrency investors are looking to reap massive returns as the 50-year-old international payment system moves onto the blockchain beginning in November 2022. This is part of what is known as ISO 2022, a single standardization approach to be used by all financial standard initiatives. The new standardization is set to officially begin in November 2022 and be fully implemented by November 2025. There are many cryptocurrencies that will be integrated into this new financial system, referred to as ISO 2022 complement cryptocurrencies. I think he meant to say compliant. And there is much speculation these cryptocurrencies will soar in price once the standard is implemented. 45.8 45.8 million transactions per day. This is how many transactions the existing international payment systems handle. Commonly known as SWIFT, this international money transfer system was founded in the early 1970s and has been the backbone for international and cross-border payments for nearly 50 years. The problem with the existing SWIFT system is that it's slow, expensive, laden with paperwork, and founded on legacy technology. The implementation of ISO 222 will bring the antiquated financial transactional system up to date by utilizing blockchain technology and the incorporation of a multitude of cryptocurrencies to handle the transaction volume. Everything that we've been saying. As a consequence of the implementation of this new system, it is anticipated the cryptocurrencies which will form this new financial system will perform very well. Investment opportunity of a lifetime, 100%. There's a lot of speculation that the cryptocurrencies that are compliant with the standard and part of the network will increase tremendously in value. Rumor has it that the switch will happen in just one day, likely a day in November. There are only a handful of cryptocurrencies that are identified as ISO 222 compliant and will make up this new financial system. You have IOTA, Algorand, XTC, Quant, Constellation, Hedera Hashgraph, Stellar, XRP, bam, there you go, all right there. Then IOTA, Hedera, Quant, Algorand, XTC, Ripple, Stellar, there we go. The biggest opportunity, 
investment opportunity of 2022. There's still a lot of speculation as to the exact timing and true volume of transaction this new blockchain system will handle. Given that this new international payments financial system is set to replace the existing international payments financial system, the volume of transaction this new system will handle will be unlike anything the cryptocurrency space has ever seen. If all international payments are put through these few ISO 222 compliant cryptocurrencies, the sheer volume of transactions could boost both the market cap and market value of these cryptos considerably. Bam, right there. And then crypto oversight should resemble traditional bank rules, Fed official says. That's Michael Barr. He was the former Ripple Labs advisor and Michigan University Law School dean, who is now the U.S. Federal Reserve's vice chairman for supervision, said crypto activities need greater regulatory oversight. He says the U.S. Central Bank will work with other bank regulators to oversee any crypto activity that banks engage in. He also addressed stablecoin oversight, said crypto isn't yet living up to its potential to expand financial access, and said that he doesn't think issuing a digital dollar is an urgent need from the Fed. Uh, Barr, appointed by President Joe Biden, is widely expected to be a tough regulator on Wall Street banks. It's been less clear what his view on digital assets will be, considering he once worked in the industry, holding a position on Ripple's advisory board. We plan to work with other bank regulatory agencies to ensure that crypto activity inside banks is well regulated based on the principle of same risk, same activity, same regulation, regardless of the technology used for the activity. I plan to make sure that the crypto activity of banks that we supervise is subject to the necessary safeguards that protect the safety of the banking system as well as bank customers. In the coming years, the Fed will be involved in deciding how the government treats stablecoins such as Tether's USDT and Circle Internet Financial's USDC. It also expected to decide whether to issue a digital dollar, a move with major potential consequences for the crypto industry. Barr's academic work has painted a CBDC in a positive light, suggesting it could boost the government's financial inclusion aims. Barr carefully addresses the digital dollar question, saying he agrees with the current Fed position to study the issue carefully and to insist that Congress and the White House are on the same page before the Fed does anything. There we go. And then I'm going to save that for a second and that as well too we'll dive into these other things so today is the launch date of pan pangolin so i need to look into this actually asap to see if we're actually getting this or not so i'm going to keep this up so after this video i can look into it but then we have we're on to the next leg of a bitcoin rally i i remember i sh i think i shared this in the the past video global liquidity pool so the CPMI report explains how intraday liquidity bridges between central banks may improve the efficiency of the global liquidity pool of banking groups operating in several currencies and help mitigate foreign exchange and credit risk, cross-border payments. So a global liquidity pool, that's exactly what we're talking about when I'll show you the X pool. So Ripple had a patent that they filed called X pool. You could probably look it up on Google dot, uh, Google patents, but this is what it looked like. And they're talking about global liquidity pool. Well, if that doesn't look like a global liquidity pool to me, I don't know what does, but it's literally explaining the use case of what Ripple and XRP provide from the bank of international settlements. So they're the, they're the central bank of central banks. So we know what's going to go down. It's just a matter of when. And we have the timeline of all these events that are happening. And then another big event that's happening is Cybos 2022. It's SWIFT's global conference. They do an annual conference uh, every year. So get ready for SWIFT at Cybos. Fed up with rushing from call to call. Let's see when this is going down. They're going to be talking about with the November 2022 deadline fast approaching, the standards forum is the perfect place for everything ISO 2022. Let me see when this is happening. October 10 to October 13. So 10, 10, 22 to 10, 13, 22 in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. I think I would actually hear. I think I remember seeing that. But um, yeah, so that's happening. It's going down. So they're going to be talking. So after two long years, Cybos is back as an in-person event, kicking off live from Amsterdam from 10, 13, October 2022. For those who can't make it, you can watch online. So they're going to be talking about trends in technology, regulation, risk, and sustainability. Something to keep on the radar. And then HBAR is being added to Coinbase tomorrow. That's big. And then, nope, nothing there. 
I think there's actually a big thing happening this week as far as a conference, but I'll share that in my next newsletter. So Russia's top banks are switching away from SWIFT and now using an equivalent Chinese system called CIPS. EU and USA sanctions are pushing Russia into the Chinese financial ecosystem where the $80 trillion in commodity Russia commodity reserves will be traded and supplied via Asia. Russia's top bank have started lending out yuan. Yep, so we read that. So Vladimir Putin said today that traditional reserve currencies like the U.S. dollar and the euro have lost their credibility as a basis for international settlements. Things are about to get even wilder in currency markets. What do all countries agree on? Gold they are buying. And then Stellar, we have this. The world's financial systems are disconnected, disjointed, and inefficient. Financial inclusion only happens when we open up all the financial world has to offer to anyone, anywhere, the Stellar Network, a universe of opportunities. So let's watch this little uh, promo. The world is full of tensions, all simultaneously pulling on the fabric of our financial system. And that is exactly where we see change pairing, a change that enables all the financial world has to offer to anyone, anywhere. The Stellar Network, a universe of opportunity. The world is full of tension. Big stuff. You saw that cross-border payments thing in there too. Right here, cross-border money transfers right there. Then we have ABI's press release on Spuntna with 100 banks live. So FinTech, Spuntna, 100 banks operating on the sector blockchain. In Italy, it is fully operational, the Italian banking sector blockchain. Since October, around 100 banks have been operating on Spuntna, the nodes network, the third group of banks. And Spuntna utilizes Quant. I believe. So the Spunna app sits on SIA slash Nexi's blockchain infrastructure. So SIA launches the blockchain infrastructure for ABI's new application, Spuntna Banka DLT. And then you can see here Spuntna Banka DLT is based on SIA chain, the private tech infrastructure created by SIA that enables financial institutions, corporates, and public sector bodies to develop and implement blockchain based innovative applications in a safe and protected manner. So the project by ABI and ABI Lab was made possible in addition to SIA, also thanks to the technical partners NTT Data and R3 with the Corda Enterprise Platform. So SIA, right here. So the breakthrough was achieved by integrating Quant Network's Overledger technology, the world's only DLT operating system that allows interoperability into the SIA chain private blockchain infrastructure, leveraging on 580 European network nodes with CNET. And the integration provides the ability to bridge permission blockchain instances between SIA chain and other external networks, which could not be previously connected in order to have cross-platform applications and services covering, for example, notarization payments and KYC. The development of the solution began in mid-2019 and a full program of testing has been executed on SIA chain, R3 Corda, and private Ethereum platforms right there. So you have R3, which we know who's tied up with them. You have SIA chain, you have 100 banks operating on uh, blockchain. And then you also saw in there, DT, sorry, NTT data. So it partners with NTT data. And if you guys remember this document that I used to share all the time, and it's basically the key about what's going to happen. Let me see if I can find it. Here it is. Yes, let's go. All right, so NTT data. This is one of their documents back like, what was it? I think 2017, 2017. And we're seeing this play out five years later, September of 2017 too, five years ago. And I was talking about from the internet of information, the internet of value, you probably all remember this now. And then it was talking about how blockchain and DLT adoption and maturity, technology breakthrough, experimental platforms, and that Bitcoin and Ethereum are testing the use of cryptocurrency as smart contracts, and it's experimental. But when enterprise level platforms for specific use cases come in, that's the maturity and adoption phase. And that's where cross-border payments, meeting the rising demands for faster, more efficient international payments, Ripple comes in, and then capital markets and trade finance, chain, chain, and R3 quarter, Hyperledger Fabric, and digital asset come in. It's all happening in front of our eyes. Then you can see um, cross-border real-time growth settlement from 1980 to 2017. This is how it was with correspondent banks. And now you have banks adoption of real-time settlement via DLT, utilizing XRP Ripple. You see all the ripples in there. You see the Interledger protocol, central banks, and I don't know what LPs are, 
but seems like it's something to do at Ripple. And then you have cross-border real-time gross settlement. And you have all the banks utilizing Ripple, <laughs> literally Ripple all across here. You have the XRP ledger in place. And then you have ILP and a ledger protocol. You have global real-time growth settlement will remove friction costs and risk from cross-currency transactions, distributed ledger technology, and in particular, the XRP ledger will enable banks to settle cross-currency transactions in real time. Something impossible today. I'm going to share this with you guys right now. You guys got to read this. It's by far one of the things I've always resorted back to because of how just game changer it is. Game changer. So then you have Interledger enabling interoperability across platforms, all platforms, all the money. You have Japan, Europe, United States, the UK, China, all their central bank payment systems via ILP, XRP Ledger, connecting via ILP to regular banks, connecting via ILP to other platforms in blockchains and DLTs, Hyperledger, Corda R3, Digital Asset, Ethereum to Capital Markets, to you see the DTCC, right? Then trade finance, SAP, IBM, Oracle, Internet of Things, Apple, Android, Tesla, Intel, payment platforms, Apple Pay, Google Pay, PayPal, Square, Alipay, marketplaces, Amazon, Rakuten, eBay, Airbnb, Alibaba, other platforms, Facebook, Microsoft, Google, Netflix, Uber. It's gonna literally run everything. 2025, this is all set in stone, all set in stone. We have the timeline. You can see that 2020 to 2025 blockchain solutions also this too so we see this to here this is 2020 well 2017 to 2025 but now we're in 20 we're in the final phase ripple becomes the standard for international money transfers between banks and interledger protocol becomes the standard protocol for connecting banks cash ledgers as part of ripple software blockchain solutions for capital markets and trade finance emerge which has already happened with the dtcc r3 corda digital asset holdings hyperledger fabric etc and then interledger protocol Java becomes the interoperability standard for Hyperledger Foundation projects. And then from 2025 to 2030, blockchains and distributed ledger solutions mature and all asset exchange networks become interoperable with Interledger protocol. All the money will run through it. It's one of the biggest things. All right, let's keep moving. So this is some of IOTA's use cases. So possible real world use case, paying toll fees automatically, self-driving car approaching and connecting to a toll booth. So IOTA's for Internet of Things, paying exact amount of IOTA automatically based on driven meters with no waiting time. So like imagine a thing like a car, a smart car, paying a smart toll or paying a smart parking meter. It's gonna be through a blockchain-based network, secure like IOTA, that will um, make these micro transactions via thing to thing. That's how it's gonna go down. This is the world on the future. That's what it's gonna look like. Real world use case, autonomous smart fridge. A smart fridge can check the remaining stock of selected groceries, place and pay orders to the cheapest shop autonomously with IOTA tokens and get them delivered instantly via a drone. It's the fourth industrial revolution, guys. The fourth industrial revolution. Possible real world use cases, self-charging delivery dro drones, user pays drone for delivery per meter, drone low on battery on its core, searches for a solar panel, recharges itself and pays the amount and IOTA directly to the so solar panel. IOTA smart home integration concept. Temperature sensor in a house takes a room temperature. If temperature is set is below the one set, activate radiators. The session power that session powers uh, usage is instantly paid using IOTA. Power sensor tracks amount of power used to reach target temperature during session. It's the future. So we're so ahead of the game. We know what the capabilities of blockchain can provide. And now we can start thinking of solutions that we could maybe start ourselves to get, get ahead of the game and develop the next Facebook, the next Google of this new technology. So world currency reserves since the 19th century. So we can see the change of the reserves. So this, this actual uh, diagram is in Agartha where we cover world reserve currencies, but it's good to see other people sharing it here because it shows you kind of how the micro cycles play out. I mean, the macro cycles play out for reserve currencies. So we see the USD 1980s and then the ECU 
that was the uh, European currency unit. Remember, we learned about that in a search for a world currency. Then it changed to the euro in the 2000s. We have all these coming in. So this is on 2021. This is probably below 50% now. It's probably below 50% now. I would love to see an updated version of this. Then I just closed something out. All right, so XRP is the wholesale CBDC. Ripple is the central bank. It's quite possible that Ripple could become an international kind of central bank. It could become a bank of international settlements or an IMF type institution. Be huge. Then you have JP Morgan preparing for a blackout in Germany. Narrative or facts, you be the judge. This is in German, so I'm not going to read it, but there's a lot of blackout talk going on. Then we have a must watch. Wondering if India will be following the G7 price cap on Russian oil. Indian's petroleum minister said, we will buy oil from Russia. We will buy from wherever. I have a moral duty to my consumer. And that's the case. All these countries across the world aren't going to just like abide by what the U.S. says. Oh, don't get oil or commodities from Russia or all these other nations. When they, If that's the only way of getting it, they're going to get it because they have a moral obligation to their country's citizens. So the U.S. and their weaponizing sanctions against some of these countries that provide us with everything that we need as far as commodities goes is not going to do us any good because they're going to side with the country that's providing them with the things that they need for their citizens. So the U.S. is burying themselves uh, their own hole here. They're digging their own grave. So we're not going to watch that because we already get the point. But now we have Oldie but Goldie. Ripple is here to make a dent in the universe. So this is Navin Gupta, managing director director of the MENA Ripple. So MENA is like it's like the Asian, I think, or Middle Eastern, Northern Asia. I think that's right. Region uh, of Ripple. He's the managing director. So Ripple is not an ordinary company. We are not here to make us have a small market share or make a small amount of money. We are here to make a dent in the universe. And that's what they're doing. Like we saw, we read in that PowerPoint document that it said that something that was impossible before. And then the Holy Grail of cross border payments in search of a thousand, thousand of year solution to a problem, right? So, like, this is something that has been a problem for thousands of years. And Ripple, the company with XRP, is here to solve that problem. They're not here for a small market share or to do something small. They're really here to make a dent in the universe and do something very disruptive in the sense of financial system. And they're accomplishing it every day. And then you have El Salvador president to slam ruling financial elite and media in upcoming Bitcoin magazine print exclusive. We'll see about that. And then... We saw the bank, we saw that, we saw this. And then this is the CEO of Stellar, Danielle Dixon. She said, looking forward to returning to Capitol Hill to speak with Senate AG Dems and Senate Agriculture about legislation and provide more clarity, transparency, and trust in digital commodities. So I think that their cryptos will be regulated as digital commodities. There, there'll be three different sections, cryptocurrencies, digital securities, or crypto securities and crypto commodities or digital commodities. That's what it's going to lay out to be. And overall, they'll be labeled digital assets, but they'll have different kind of subcategories, digital securities, digital commodities, digital currencies. And then this is what I need to look into for us. And then we'll look, take a look at this. So Europe's non ferrous metal producers call for emergency EU action to prevent permanent deindustrialization from spiraling electricity and gas prices. So there was like a commission of, so the Euro Meta UX, so metals at the heart of Europe. So this whole like collective uh, metal suppliers are saying like, there's a huge crisis that is about to unfold if they don't like do something as far as Europe goes. See all the signatures from all these uh, big kind of metals corporations, energy corporations saying that, there needs to be something that happens and they need to do something or there's going to be a exponential crisis as far as the high energy prices in Europe. So we see that there. And then this is the Central Bank of Ireland, climate risks in the financial system and overview of channels, impact and heterogeneity. Climate risks in the financial system. It's talking about GHG, greenhouse gases. Let's see if we can find anything good in here. So the energy sector switching to a low CO2 energy, probably energy web. 
And then climate policies, it's talking about transis transition risk, conclusions, status gaps, priorities. The article has presented some of the more salient climate risk channels for the real economy and how these may affect the financial sector. There's considerable uncertainty regarding future climate risks. The potential for a significant financial sector impact is apparent, not just through increased weather climate related damage, but also through the rapid and costly technological and behavioral transition to net zero. However, our understanding of the links between climate risk and financial risk is at an early stage, as are the potential spillovers and feedback loops for a small open economy such as Ireland. Yeah, so it's talking about all that stuff. So that looks like it's it for this newsletter catch up. I'm going to do another newsletter today, catching up on stuff over the weekend as far as in the news that has come out today. So I will see you in that follow-up newsletter.